Good morning and welcome to our conversation starter this morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. Um, today we're going to be discussing um, a topic that's uh, very prevalent in the property market um, and it's basically just insights into property valuations from a banking perspective. And I want to thank you all for making time to join us today. We have a really, really amazing lineup of, of panelists who I will introduce you to shortly. Um, they are from various parts of our, our, our business and um, they will be going through all the questions that you throw at us during uh, this, this session. My name is Paul Hasler and I'll be hosting you today. The real purpose around a conversation starter or these sessions is to engage with you, our clients, in a much more informal in environment um, where we hold richer conversations. Um, and these are the follow up from our thought leadership webinar, which we held on the 25th of May. That was titled South African Property Market and the Key Factors and Trends. It was a much higher sort of a macro look at the market. And with this session, we really want to go deeper in and, and have a much more micro look at property and then look at things that will affect your individual property. The valuations are obviously critical in assessing an application for a facility secured by a property. And together with valuations, there are some other factors that influence the final credit decision. And so in conjunction with us discussing valuation methods or capitalization rates, interest rates, we would like to bring some of these other concepts into the discussion. And they may trigger um, something with you where you've, you've needed to look at that information. And as we've discovered, uh, I think particularly in KZN, our environment is constantly changing, both on a macro and a micro level. You've got the COVID pandemic closer to home for some of us is the July looting and the recent floods. And this demonstrates how quickly life changes. Um, and in a flash, these events have affected how a lot of people perceive the world and the environment around them. And the part that we want to demonstrate today is, is that market values of properties uh, and related credit decisions are not um, isolated from these shocks. Um, and protected from these events. And this can be seen in the sort of in the current oversupply of um, office accommodation with the work from home scenarios. Um, and if we look at the um, knock on of that is the reduced rentals that um, are happening across A, B and C grade offices. The other knock on effect of something like the COVID pandemic is the um, semi grating. All this was discussed in our um, high level sort of macro environment discussion in our webinar in May. This webinar is available to you and we can send it to you. Um, I will let you know the details of that a little bit a little bit later. Today, as I said, we really want to look at sort of micro uh, details around the valuation and the things that impact a valuation of a property and how to get the most out of your property in terms of getting a facility. Before we start, just some housekeeping um, in case um, you have a problem with a freeze during the webinar, just press the refresh button and it'll take you back to where you originally stopped watching the webinar, where the webinar froze. The other thing is we've already received some questions from um, the viewers. And if you want to submit a question, please use the Q&A chat box on the left hand side and submit a question during the webinar and we will do everything we can to get to those questions. Hopefully the ones we've received might answer some of, of your question. Otherwise, we will deal with it after the webinar. You will receive an email in the next few days with a link to this recording um, and you would be able to obviously share it if you want or watch it again. Um, and then just please remember we do have other thought leadership insights the recordings of previous webinars, and we can obviously offer those. They're available on our NetBank Private Wealth SA website. I just want to take you through a little bit of the um, CVP of, of NetBank Private Wealth and NetBank Financial Planning. We 
Use our globally integrated and advice-led approach to connect your financial decisions to your goals and aspirations. And a big part of this is that your money decisions connect your goals and needs, your dreams and fears, your, your attitudes, and the role you play in your community to how you earn, save, and spend. Uh, this is what we in our business call connected wealth. The fact that every single financial decision you make is informed by and affects every other aspect of your life. Our globally integrated advice makes these threads much more visible and therefore much more manageable. If so, it also connects you to the solutions, services and expertise that you need to make the most of your money and achieve your definition of success. And I guess the way to look at this in plain language is this means we get up each and every single day motivated by how we can help you make the best money decisions, whether it's in property, investments, uh, structure, fiduciary, um, and this is all to meet your needs, goals, and aspirations um, in terms of, of how you connect with your money. We've gone through that quite quickly, but we really come to the the crunch part now, and this is why you, why everyone has joined us. I would like to introduce our panelists uh, to you. As I said, we've already started to receive some questions, so we will get them busy and answering those questions as quickly as possible. Our first panelist is Petruise van Drissel. She's a lending specialist, um, mostly acqu acquisition based uh, and based out of Cape Town. Petruise has been in banking and specifically property finance for more than 20 years. Um, and as I said, is, is based in our, in our Cape Town office. Emma Cornelius is an internal commercial valuer. Uh, she's based in Joburg um, in our central region. She's previously worked across the Nedbank group um, in private wealth, business banking and CIB. So it has a, a wide range of um, expertise across properties um, whether they are small, commercial, industrial, across the whole lot. Our third panelist is Kubeshni, Naid, uh, Kubeshni Govinda, sorry. She's also a lending specialist uh, in structured lending, but here she's based in Durban. So we're giving some geographic, uh, a geographic look to how the questions are answered. She's worked in banking for oh, well over 17 years and has been with us in Nedbank Private Wealth for the last five years. And our final panelist, last but not least, is Theo Duplessis. He's our regional head in the Chwane and Inland area. Um, Theo joined Nedbank in 1994 um, and has worked also across many of the divisions and has built up an incredible expertise over this time. In, uh, originally in commercial banking and then in CIB, uh, corporate and investment banking. He joined us at NPW in 2019 and has been involved in property finance since then. Again, our panelists have a, a, a range of, of expertise and we're hoping that we can put this to use today. I think going through the questions, I'd like to start with kind of going back to the beginning, if I may, and coming to you, Petruiz. This question is really What's been asked is, is going back to the start, when you meet a client, what are you looking for to establish a lending facility? And sort of what documentation do you need? How would you, how would a poten you know, potentially make the journey through the application process easier and less stressful for, for a client? I think people are finding um, applying for finance quite scary in some respects. And I think really it's just in essence is what clarity would you need from a prospective client um, in order to facilitate an application? Thanks, Patrice. Thanks, Paul. Um, we are starting off um, with the very first step in the lending process. That's a very good question and it's quite a mouthful to answer. Um, but I think it's important to highlight, highlight how crucial it is um, to get quality information in the beginning. And this is to speed up the, the turnaround times of our decisions and the outcome of an application and is therefore of the battle. So it's important to put time into and thought into your application. Um, banks are all about managing risk. 
um, and the pricing and suitability of the finance structure is directly affected by the, um, the information that we receive. Um, I'm just thinking in the programming world, there's a saying garbage in, garbage out, and that's very much applicable in our world as well. Um, furthermore, um, an, another uh, good reason for us to obtain as much good quality information as possible up front um, is because we are um, forced to do so by legislation. Um, obtain the information and hold on to it for a specific period in time as a bank. Um, and then importantly, um, this is the time to build a quality uh, relationship with your structured lender as well. One of trust and understanding, um, again, to affect the outcome of the application. Um, in terms of the actual information that we would need, there's three pillars that we build an application around. Um, and that also determines the information we would need. The first pillar is the borrower. Who is our client? Is it a person? Is it a juristic entity? If it's a juristic entity, who are the shareholders? What is their shareholding percentages? Um, is it the same entity that's going to hold the property um, versus uh, the, the lender or the borrower? Um, what are the financial? What is the financial strength of the shareholders? The personal balance sheets. We may not ask for suretyship of each and every uh, shareholder, but we do need to have an overview of who we are dealing with. Who is the main person managing the property, um, making the day-to-day -day, uh, decisions on the property? What is that person's experience and background? The next uh, pillar, the property. So here we need information around the property. What is the legal description of the property, the earth number, the street address? Is the, is the property being acquired and then we need a copy of the offer to purchase? Sometimes we need building plans. Um, we're not going to go into building and development loans right now and they, that could be a whole discussion on its own. But um, we, we may need building plans uh, even for a straightforward acquisition depending on the, on the specific transaction. And then any other contract that may affect that property or the status of the property or the ownership of the property and the rights uh, of the property. Then the third pillar is the cash flow. So often clients tell me, listen, you've got my property and you've got me a surety. Why do you need to assess the cash flow as well? But the bank is not in the business of selling properties to, to recoup funds lent out. So we have to show that we are responsible in our lending and um, therefore that uh, the um, facility applied for and approved is affordable. So for that purpose, we need the financial statements of the borrowing entity. Sometimes it's a shelf company and then we need the financial statements of the entity that we're going to rely on to service the debt. If it's a prop co where it's going to be rentals, we need the rental schedules. The rental schedules would include your tenants, start and end dates of the leases, um, how long that tenant has been in place. Um, sometimes it's short leases, but the tenants have been renewing often, and that's information that we need to know. Um, if the serviceability comes from other sources, we need to identify those sources um, and, and then back that information up with bank statements showing the actual cash flow um, through the accounts and tax certificates and, and, and so forth. Um, but don't get daunted by that, by this list of information, because your structured lender will go through it with you and explain it every step of the way. And I just want to end off my answer by saying um, it's very crucial for the client at this point in time, in the very beginning, to share any available other risk factors that may affect the transaction. Because if you share that with your structured lender um, or your banker, they can build um, mitigants around it up front and build a loan structure to defend against those risk factors. And then it will result in a good experience for both the client and the bank. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Patrice. That's very comprehensive. And I think to your point, the not to get too distracted by the list um, a lot of it is a progression, and as you build the relationship, so you start to to gather the information. I guess a key thing is something like an organogram, 
uh, to at least give the basic structure or your basic business structure, which then can be um, analyzed by, by the, the lending specialist. Um, a second um, question that um, we have, and I guess this is one of the, the, the main reason why we're here today, is that um, we look at, at valuations, and I think um, a lot of um, you on, online have, have kind of come to the same sort of uh, conclusion is, is how do you, you know, how do you value what um, methods are used? And I'd like to come to you, uh, Emma, if, if I may, there's uh, sort of a, a, it's three questions, but I'll ask them all at once, um, if you don't mind, and, and you can um, pick up them as you go. Um, the question is, there's several types of property valuation methods, and um, perhaps we can just focus on, on, on two, please. Um, yeah. And the real um, place is, is just to elaborate on the um, income capitalization versus the sales comparison. And I think that's where people get, uh, particularly with sectional title um, assets, um, they get a little bit confused at, at why you would use one and not the other. And what's the difference? Thanks, Emma. Yeah. Um, good morning, Paul, and good morning to our NetBank audience. Um, that is quite a jam-packed um, question. So let me get started by stating that all methods of valuations starts with a basis of comparison. Whether it's price, value, or rates, these are benchmarked in our assessments. And from this, we are then able to infer the applicable analysis to determine value. So when we talk about the sales comparison approach, this forms that um, basis of comparison, and it provides us with an indication of value by comparing the subject property with recently transacted comparable properties where price information is available. So we use this, like you mentioned, for sectional title properties and residential properties where there are frequent transactions that have taken place in the market. Um, as valuers, we are then able to do a comparative analysis in determining both similarities and differences between the subject property and comparable properties. Um, and then we are able to make adjustments to determine value. Um, adjustments are critical in the sales comparison approach because by the nature, property is heterogeneous, so no two properties are alike, and we make that assessment as we do our research. Um, when speaking to the income capitalization method, um, an indication of value is provided by converting future cash flows to a single current value. In essence, we are determining value of a property's income producing abilities. Yeah, we assume that the property is fully lit at market norms, and it requires analysis of rental rates, vacancies, property expenses, and so forth. And we capitalize the net figure, known as the net operating income, to determine value. The method also involves um, addressing issues such as lettability and saleability, um, and this speaks to the serviceability of the property that um, Peter has mentioned earlier. A third method is also important to note, um, and that is the replacement cost. And this simply looks at replacing the cost of the building should anything happen, as we have recently experienced in our market. So, yeah, I think um, the, the the critical part that we suddenly found out, um, especially here in KZN um, and through the uh, writing and looting, was that replacement cost and exactly. how how critical it is to get that absolutely accurate. Um, and I think the, the the key is to is to revisit that because uh, a lot of people are kind of looking at at valuations, saying, "Well, I've got that valuation. I'll just um, escalate by a percentage." But actually, you need to have a proper look into the costs of re-establishing a property, including the loss of rental um, that would would come with a destroyed building. Correct. Just also to remember that valuation is done on a date of valuation. So when we undertake a um, evaluation it's valid for 12 months and um, at any given time things can change so when we say evaluation date is for the first of june we are stating that as of the first of june these are the facts the, this is what the value is but those items can change over the course of the period yeah as I, again we've uh, we've had those uh, you know those big shocks um, to our market and and if you look at the um the commercial office market, um, I think probably 12 months is a very, very long time in exactly. that world. Yeah. Things can change. Vacancies change, rental rates change, and those things have to be considered, yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much, Emma. 
and we'll come back to you with some more of the uh, valuation questions as as they come up. Um, I'd like to move on to you, Kabesh, now um, in your role as a, as a lending specialist. It's really looking at clients who have properties already and are looking to um, expand their portfolio or um, use a property to, to generate equity. So th the question goes is um, how would clients access equity in their properties and then use this equity as a deposit on a new property purchase or to renovate, extend an existing property? And I think this would go to our um, refinancing of a property, kind of the, the retro finance um, method that we use where we can use the equity in a, in a property or portfolio of properties to effectively purchase a new property and then this uh, for, for and that purchase is effectively for cash, which speeds up the process. Um, and then at a later stage, the um, new property could then be financed. Kabesh, your thoughts on that? Please. I think you've just answered that entire question <laughs> in its entirety, <laughs> Paul, but thank you for that. Uh, just to uh, quickly go through uh, our process, it's a very simple process. So what I will uh, chat to you all about now is the existing properties that clients have with us and thereafter the new property acquisition. So on the existing property side, we would do a very simple exercise and I'll give you a very simple scenario right now. Uh, we would revalue the property to ascertain value so that we can unlock equity in the property so that we can refinance the property and the clients can have additional funds either to renovate or extend the current property portfolio. So the exercise, like I said, is quite simple. Uh, for argument, if a client has a 10 million facility and the balance outstanding is 5 million, we can take this facility back up to 10 million or even more, extend much more funding dependent on a new valuation. And when what we can also do is refinance the property so that the surplus can be used to renovate uh, the existing property that we do have. So if a client approaches us to unlock uh, equity for um, a new property, um, maybe he wants a deposit or he wants to purchase that uh, new acquisition for cash, we will do very similarly. We will assess their property portfolio and to find out if there is equity to unlock to give them further funding. So usually we would take the entire property portfolio and do our assessments and of course send for valuation to ascertain what the actual property portfolio is worth. And um, most times the new acquisition is purchased for cash or if the client decides to put a significant deposit towards the acquisition. Now, once the new acquisition is registered and the transfer is done, we can also take the new property and put it into what we call a basket facility where we can unlock further equity for future acquisitions. So like I said, the process will be to obtain new valuation reports and of course also to assess the financial position of the borrower to demonstrate serviceability of the increased loan. Thank you, Paul. Kabesh, so um, would, would it, if the client was planning a future, a future purchase or was looking at making a future purpose, this would kind of be something that we would be able to do now to get that piece in place and then go ahead with the purchase in a month or in two months. Absolutely. So usually because the properties are already registered uh, with that bank, it's easier to unlock the equity. And uh, usually the time frames for a new purchase is very limited. So it gives the client an opportunity to negotiate better because they have a uh, quite a significant deposit to put or using the equity in the existing properties to pay for that new property cash. So it's a quicker and a faster process than waiting to bring on the new property and to refinance or sorry, to finance from scratch versus refinancing existing properties within the portfolio. Ah, thank you. Sounds much more efficient. Yeah. Um, our next question is going down to um, quite some specifics. And I'd like to bring Theo in here, if I may. Um, and this is kind of a lead on from our May um, webinar, where 
it's discussing just asking about the current economic climate and what you can do to increase the chances of renewing a lease or securing a new tenant. Um, and it's really, I guess, the question is, we've seen rental creep. So um, the uh, A, A grade offices are now almost charging B grade rentals. And I think, Theo, that the question is, is how do you make your property attractive to tenants? And um, yeah, I guess more attractive than the property down the road. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, morning, Paul, and morning to everybody. And uh, thanks for having me again. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know why I, I all, all, always get the difficult questions, but um, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll have a go at it. So, so, so maybe if, if we just take a step back and, and, and just say, you know, why is it that there, that there are so many um, uh, vacancies and why, uh, you know, rental rates, like you mentioned, are under pressure? And, and, I, and I think we sometimes overcomplicate things. You know, uh, if, if you really just take a broad view, the, the, the simple answer is that they are, the, the supply is bigger than the demand. I mean, it's, it's sort of 101 economics, you know, so, so uh, there, there are simply more properties available than, um, than what we have tenants around. And, and, and because of that, you, you sit with existing tenants that are, um, they, they, they are literally pushed to a point where they, uh, in some cases, just trying to recover some of the expenses, you know, uh, never mind all of it. Um, you know, so, so, so like everything else, I, I think tenants are just uh, sort of looking for value for money, you know. Um, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter what you go and buy, you, you want the best. Um, value for the money that you have available. So, um, and 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 then of course uh, in South Africa you've you've got the added um, service delivery issue that's now popping up. And I mean we've we've seen large businesses moving out of um, areas and uh, you, you, you know, but <laughs> that's a discussion for another day. Um, but it's but it's also there in the back of your head. You know, um, uh, is the area that you in. Um, what is the service delivery like in that area? But in any case, so, so so to get back to your question, what can you do? Now, I mean, that's a million dollar question. Um, uh, tenants really want what they had before, but they want it for cheaper. And, and, and because there's so much competition, they want better. You know, so think of things like uh, generators, uh, you know, and, and, and this time and, and day, if, if, if your building doesn't have a generator, I think you've got a problem. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, if uh, the, there's an old joke that's not very good, but uh, uh, if, if people ask you how, how well or how much you should spend on your um, security at home, uh, the the short answer is just make sure that you spend more than your neighbour, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> they hopefully going to leave you alone and go there. And 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 the same applies in in a property like this, you know. Uh, if your neighbour is if the neighbouring property is vacant and it's going to gener generate and you don't have it, well, you know, you, you've got a problem. Um, think about security, and and South Africa security is always at the top of mind. Um, maintenance, you know. Uh, what does the building look like? Uh, uh, it's 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 often just what you can see, um, uh, you know. Uh, then then of course there are things like rent-free periods and 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 reduced uh, rates for a period of time. And uh, you see weird and wonderful things that uh, people come up uh, with. But I, I I think it's in, uh, it's important to just to always take a long-term uh, sort of view uh, when you make these decisions because property is a long-term investment you know um uh, we, we we've signed we've seen clients signing shorter leases you know which is nice for flexibility give somebody a a, a one year short and then hopefully in a year's time uh, things have changed and you can up it um or, or you may be forced even further down you know uh, banks like long term because it buys it locks in uh, cash flows longer but but we understand, you know, short term in, in, in this day and age is, is probably better. Um, then uh, uh, it may sound sound basic, but go and find tenants. You know, um, I often see too many uh, landlords having vacant properties and, you know, there's a two let sign on and they phone a, a state agent and what? Go and find the tenant. 
you know, uh, what is your property best suited for? Who would who would be best um, uh, sort of a place to 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 use and to fill your property and approach that party and say, hey, I've got this space, you know, um, uh, what are you paying now? Maybe I can give you a better deal, you know, because rest assured, uh, the other landlords is doing it to your tenants, you know, so. Um, Always talk to your tenants, listen to your tenants. Uh, um, you know, sometimes we use estate agents and you get distant from your tenants, uh, stay close to them, speak to them. Yeah, you'll quickly pick up what makes them tick and what makes them stay with you. Uh, yeah, cut costs, eh? operating cost is uh, so important for the tenant. Um, Grey water, uh, solar, um, Thing DIY maintenance, that sort of thing, you know. Uh, yeah, and 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 like I said, make sure what your opposition is doing because uh, your opposition is the vacant property next to you, you know, because he, he he's talking to your tenants. Uh, rest assured. Um, yeah, so I I hope that's that sort of answered your question. Yeah, no, I think that's that's quite comprehensive, and it certainly gives us. Um, a, a, a wide perspective or a wide lens on the, on the problem. And I think uh, the, the key as well is, is that people spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day um, in their offices or in their um, where, where they work. Uh, yeah. And it becomes quite crucial for them to be comfortable and to kind of feel like a second home, I guess. Um, we have a few more um, questions where well, we actually I, I can see them coming through nicely. Thank you very, very much for your for your interest and for actually posting. We have another question for Emma. It's around uh, valuations. It's a two part question, so I'll ask both parts now and then and Emma can can have a have a crack at 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 answering the two parts. The um, the big part, I think, is what people get um, concerned about with valuations is is the cap rate or the capitalization rate, because obviously that goes a long way to determining the risk and and the ultimately the market value. Uh, and as I said, the, the the question here is the cap rate has a fundamental effect on the value of a property. How are cap rates determined for different areas and for different properties? So that's the first question, and um, I will repeat the second one if you want me to later, Emma, is just so that you can start thinking on it is okay. what is the effect of interest rates on the cap rate? So we'll park that one for now and we'll just answer the first and then we can come back to the second part. Thanks, Emma. OK, so the first question is what is the capitalization rate and what, how does it determine value? So I previously alluded to the cap rate in um, when I explained what the capitalization method is um, and the capitalization method infers um, that we are discussing investment property types. So in essence, the cap rate is a ratio um, and it's an estimation of investors rate of return. So various factors influences the cap rate, such as the level of um, interest rates, which we'll get back to. Um, market transactions of similar property types and then the inherent risk that runs with property. Um, when we say inherent risk which runs with property, referring to things like um, the, the asset class, the age, the quality, condition of the building, tenant quality, lease profile, all the, the, the things that um, Theo just previously mentioned, um, which can either be a positive or negative for a property. Um, maybe by way of example, if we take an NOI and we say, let's say 100 Rand, and we assume an average property and a slightly better property, the average property could achieve a cap rate of, say, 10%, and then that would give us a value of 1,000 Rand. Um, whereas a better property could maybe, um, with a better tenant profile, we could adjust the rate to, let's say, 9%, and we would achieve a value of, um, I think it is 1,100 Rand, more, more or less. Um, so yeah, we can we can actually see the effect that the rate has based on a one percent difference and how the cap rate quantifies value in this way. Um, so the long and short part of the story is that a lower cap rate corresponds with a better valuation and better prospects of return with lower levels of risk, and the opposite is true for higher cap rates. It's also exceptionally important to understand that cap rates largely depend on the contents of the property that's being valued. So it's very property specific, it's um, asset specific, sorry, and the state of the economy. Um, can you just repeat your second question, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me call it up. 
Um, the second the second part was is what is the effect of interest rates? So we we've been in a really low interest rate environment, and we've seen over the last uh, couple of months now the increases as they are coming through. Um, and the question really is is about I think that they are alluding to that is what's the effect of interest rates on the cap rate and hence market values of properties. OK, so interest um, interest rates are interesting because it directly relates to the 10 year government bond um, and in property. This measures the risk free rate of return. Um, so going back to um, what risk factors are taken into consideration when we talk about the cap rate. So when interest rate increase or decrease the baseline for expected risk free rates shift. Um, like you mentioned, we, we've just come out of a low interest rate period and we're heading into a high risk <laughs> interest rate period. Um, and this um, essentially affects borrowing costs and borrowing costs reduces the amount we can borrow and um, has an, inf an influence on purchase power. Um, and ultimately what this does, it, it drives cap rates up. Now there is a lag between real time interest rates um, and the adjustments they of which then shifts into the um, property market and it just takes a little bit of time for us to um, for the market to digest what is happening and we see that that the rates increase. Thank you. Thanks very, very much, Emma. Um, another question that seems to be quite prevalent uh, is the uh, and I'd like to come to you, Petra Rees, on this one is uh, the and it goes, what are the types of financing structures that can be considered by banks when looking at an application? And um, it goes through the potential structure of either residential portfolio, commercial or industrial property. And it's they're really asking, is there a difference? And if so, um, what are they? Thanks, Patrice. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, financing structures are very deal specific, like you mentioned. Uh, when you were talking about the different types of properties um, and financing structures are normally built around the different factors applicable to that transaction. So uh, that would be what is the client's actual funding requirement? Um, is it a, a working capital requirement or is it a capital um, long term requirement? What can the cash flow afford? We touched briefly uh, Theo and Emma. Um, and even Kubeshni touched on um, serviceability um, and how we generate income through a property in the uh, answers. And that's so important. Um, what can the cash flow afford? How much reliance can we place, place on it? And what length of forward view can we take on, on those cash flows? And, and the quality of that cash flows goes hand in hand with that. Um, and then the type and value of the security that we've got. If it's a property, we can take a longer view on that and build a property finance type structure and so forth. So these factors will influence um, a, a loan structure, which is the term of, of a loan, um, the LTV of the loan, that, that is the loan to value. So in other words, um, what type of exposure we're willing to take versus the value of the asset. And then um, the amount profile, how it's being repaid. Is it repaid in monthly capital and interest repayments or is there an interest only period and then um, capital and interest kicks in? And that goes back to what the client's requirements and cash flow um, profile looks like. So there's a, a number of potential um, structure configurations, as you can imagine. but. We find that um, keeping it simple is, is always the best answer. So the simplest route um, from A to B is normally the best, keeping all of these factors in mind. Um, as, structures lend as structured lenders, we are then able to look at all these factors, put it together in a, um, a facility to, uh, and liaising with the client constantly to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. So the amortization period for um, residential uh, portfolios are different from commercial portfolios. As you can imagine, a residential home loan could be repaid anywhere between 20 and 30 years in certain instances, whereas an investment portfolio of residential properties, which would be more than five re uh, residential properties where the client earns income from those residential um, units or houses, would then be a residential portfolio and we would view that as a as a commercial decision and that could be amortized over 180 months 
but the loan term would not necessarily be 180 months. That would be 60 months with a residual at the end. So what amortization means is just the period it takes for the loan to be repaid from the initial balance in, the, in month one to um, where it is zero. Um, and that's where the 180 months come in. Whereas commercial industrial properties, we am, it has to amortize to zero over 120 months. Um, then often, as I said, the loan term does not necessarily need to correspond with a, a amortization period. So um, we could have a loan term of 60 months with a, with a residual at the end. And what a residual is, is whatever is left uh, over to rep be repaid at the end of the loan term. But when we propose a, a transaction in the beginning, we would know that there's going to be a residual and we would already um, have an exit for that residual in the end, whether it is to restructure the loan over another 60 months or whether it is for the client, the, perhaps the client plans to sell properties during the course of the loan term and to settle it that way. Whatever it is, we would know that up front and that would be a part of our proposal um, to be approved. Then um, I mentioned briefly that we could have, apart from uh, uh, capital and interest during our amortization period, we could have uh, an interest only facility. And that would never be because the client can't afford to repay the loan back, but it would often be because the client plans to do something else with that capital portion, which would enhance the property or the cash flows afterwards. For example, he may plan to um, use the funds to upgrade the building um, uh, internally or to fit out for a tenant who we know will um, kick in afterwards, the, the lease will kick in since we pay the, the uh, stronger cash flows will uh, kick in after the interest only period to service the, the full loan. Um, another way we could look at um, structuring a loan is if there's uh, blue chip tenants and um, you know the term of the, of the lease is long enough, we could look at stepping the repayments. So that means that um, on an annual basis or uh, in correlation with this um, increases in the, in the uh, rentals or the escalations in the rentals, we could step our repayments as well. And what that would mean is that the client um, would get a bigger loan uh, for uh, um, versus where he would have had to amortize capital and interest from the start. Um, I just want to say that um, if we stretch the term, the client must remember, uh, and that's going back to 60 months loan term versus 120 months, is, um, you know, that that does, uh, uh, or uh, sorry, not loan term, but amortization period, that does affect the, the interest um, portion. So whilst the capital portion would be lower and the, month, it, the monthly repayment would be lower because the term is stretched, um, the interest portion would be more in the end. So it's a balancing act and you do need to, to talk to your structured lender about those options. So that's my answer. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I think, you're, I think you're right in the sense that um, if you have this conversation right up front with um, your structured lender when they're visiting your premises for the first time and say, this is, and, and I think that's where it gets down to the relationship and understanding what your what your purpose is or what your plan is around your your property portfolio. Um, and then you can start to plan out these scenarios uh, right up front. Yes, that's so crucial. So that's what I meant when I said um, from the very start, the client has to uh, have a good relationship with the um, banker or structured lender because, um, you know, all the minute this information is available, they must work together as a team. That the banker become or the structured lender is part of your finance team, and um, you both work to the, towards the same goal. Absolutely, that's uh, that's so so true. Um, the yeah the the questions. I'm actually very chuffed. Um, sorry, that's a very Zimbabwean colloquial word, um, but. Um, we've got some questions coming through and they keep flowing, which is great. And uh, Kabesh, I'd like to come to you now, if, if possible. Um, this one goes around, I think we've all mentioned it in, in passing or in brief in each of the other answers, but it's really around cash flow. And um, I think 
everybody understands or should understand that cash flow is the key to any property investment. And uh, if you can just give us an, an indication on um, how the net cash flow is arrived at and, and how do banks decide on what loan to value to offer. Uh, and this goes around um, you know, the risks that the bank would want to address with that particular property. And I think Emma mentioned some of that um, mm -hmm. in one of her answers earlier. Thanks, Kavesh. Okay, thank you, Paul. Yes, definitely. Cash flow is definitely key to any property investment. So um, based on your net cash flow, funding will be calculated. And the calculation is a simple calculation of your total cash flow inflows, uh, subtract your total cash flow outflows, and your net cash flow is derived from your operating activities, investing activities, as well as financial activities. Now, when banks decide on what LTV to apply, um, we look at various factors. So we would look at the strong letability and quality and marketability of the said property. So, of course, the more lucrative the location is, we will achieve higher LTVs and lending will obviously be much higher or be pitched much higher. The debt service cover ratio is a very important ratio as well. Uh, which the banks look at because it speaks directly to a business's financial health and the ability of a finance, uh, business to repay the loan. So yes, the higher debt service cover means the deal is more lucrative. So when looking or unpacking a debt service cover ratio, anything between 1.2 and 1.5 times will be viewed as a very good deal to the bank. Most of our team also chatted around, Paul, the tenant profile, which is key to have quality tenants as well. So national tenants with longer term leases is, yes, they definitely viewed more favorably versus short term month on month leases that clients bring to the table. What we also look at from the bank's point is we unpack the financial position of the borrower as well as its sureties. Now, the reason we do this is very important because the client must have access to other surplus cash flows to support the loan in the event that the tenants default. Now, especially when a key tenant exits a property and the client is relying heavily on that rental to repay the loan. So that will bring us back to the risk that the bank addresses concentration and tenant risk. Like I said, if a large tenant moves out of a property, what would that financial impact be on the client? Can he repay the loan back to the client? Would he need a uh, restructure? And how would that impact uh, his relationship with the bank going forward? I mean, obviously, if a huge tenant, a large tenant moves out of a building, the vacancy may lead to a loss of income and, of course, the property values can fall as well. This is where the financial position of the borrower and sureties will come into play to support the loan repayments until that particular vacancy is filled. Thank you, Paul. Paul Sorry. You're muted. <laughs> you're mute. <laughs> it was the first. There was always going to be one. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, my, my my take on that is is the 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 risk factor when you're looking at a tenant, and uh, if you get a national tenant, they obviously manage your or, or negotiate the, the the rental down. And if you've got a, a more middle SMME, you end up with a with a higher um, rental, perhaps a smaller space, higher rental, and you end up um, so that the risk piece is um, changes there um, as you as you go. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to pick that up or Kabesh, you've got a, yeah, on that piece. I think Emma would be best placed. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. So, yes, I think the first thing that clients should do is to um, understand what asset is being looked at and then um, consider what that tenant mix looks, uh, looks like. Um, we've mentioned that um, nationals and franchises um, offer long term leases, um, but typically they also have lower rental rates. Um, so in some regards it's good and in some regards 
diminishes your 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 income. If we look at smaller um, operations and SSM, SSMEs, um, they might have shorter lease terms, um, but then rental rates are high. So you have to assess what your needs are and then proceed from there. Yeah, that's a that's a brilliant way of looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yes, I would I think um, you know it's important uh, to review the re the um, turnover of the tenants in the building. So that's where the history of the cash flow or the rent rolls is very important because a client might choose to have shorter term leases for a specific reason because of the market is in, um, or the economy even. You know, he he, he wants to be able to maneuver. But um, as long as you know that the turnover of the tenants aren't too fast or that there's vacancies for an extended period of time during the, the history of that, um, of that tenant, uh, tenancy in that building, then you can make a decision based on that. Yeah, we, um, sorry. Sorry, Paul, I just wanted to interject yeah. there just to talk about the vacancies as well. Um, when we when we look at vacancies, we always take the stance that the property is fully let. So where we see large vacancies, we do apply a market rate, um, rental rate, um, and then we account for turnover and um, actual vacancies um, as a long-term um, stance. So we do not penal over-penalise properties where there are vacancies. Yeah, because uh, we've um, we had an example recently where, to Petrieza's point, where we had a sort of a standard super ret. Um, in a building, it wasn't a pick and pay, it wasn't a Woolworths, it wasn't a, a shop right. Um, and if you didn't analyze the building and you just took it at face value, you would say that they, they're they not a national, so therefore there's a different risk. Except when we investigated, we found out they'd been in the building since 1956. Um, the same family had been running the business. Um, it was now third generation. Um, and that kind of gives you a comfort, uh, even though they are not necessarily a national tenant. Um, okay, thank you. That was that was a great that was a great um, great feedback. Thank you very much. Um, another question um, that's come in, and Theo, if I can if I can come over to you, is around the costs of establishing a facility, particularly in the industrial um, and the commercial space. And I, and I think it's just perhaps if we can provide a, a sort of an overview of the various costs that um, are. That you need to pay in order to establish a facility um, and and whether these costs could be capitalized or is it sure. another cash outlay thanks Theo. yeah um yeah look i mean uh, buying and selling properties is not a is not a cheap hobby eh? i mean you gotta accept that you're um that it's long-term investments you know that you're talking about and 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 you typically have have, have quite a lot of expenses, uh, deal fees, if you like, um, up front, and, and and then also again when you exit, you know. So uh, you, you always got to take these things into consideration when when you uh, uh, talk about your return on a property. But 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 just broadly speaking, I, I think most of us uh, know the various uh, prop uh, expenses, but I'll, I'll touch on them briefly. You know, so there's. There's obviously the transfer duties or VAT up front. Um, I, I'm not going to spend time on, on the difference, but uh, you only pay one of them, uh, fortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, so, 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 so there's that component, um, and, and that's normally the biggest one. Um, uh, then if, if you're a seller, you've you got to pay estate duties. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, estate duties. Um, and and if you buy an auction, generally the buyer uh, pays the auctioneer's um, fees. You know it gets added to your price. So um, uh, so yeah, that's so so, so there's a transfer. It's the cost of of, of finding a buyer. Um, and then when you get to the bank, you know uh, we, uh, we 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 very nice people. So we we start adding our fees. You know um, a, a property needs to be valued. Uh, you know, um, fortunately, there is um, fixed scales as far as valuation costs are concerned. You know, so so, so, so rest assured, um, the the bank do not take a margin on on valuation costs. Um, you know, the, the the client pays as is, and in fact, we we negotiate uh, discounted rates with uh, with the various sort of panel turn, uh, valuers that we use. Um, so uh, you, you actually pay less um, than you would have paid if you if you went directly to the valuer. 
Um, but yeah, there's there's fixed scales and it's based on the value and the complexity of the uh, of the actual valuation. Um, and and then once you've got the approval, there's obviously the attorney's fees, you know. And 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 again, we don't take a margin on it. We've got what we call panel attorneys. It's a dreaded word, but that's indeed the case. Um, and and you also get discount there, you know, because we 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 send uh, all our deals to a certain panel. Um, and it's it's because they they are reputable, but also because they they, they, they give our clients preferential um, sort of fees, and 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 then of course there's the bank fees, you know the raising fees. Um, now, I mean that's always the contentious one, you know. But you you you've got to see the, uh, raising fees in conjunction with your interest rate, um, you know. Uh, we we uh, a bank incur most of its expenses up front when the loan is uh, is um, uh, granted. I mean, think of all the time and the people and the resources that in that's involved in putting that loan in place. Where whilst in year two, three, four, and up until 10, 15 years, there's nothing. You you hopefully just pay your instalment and and we happily receive it and 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 there's no real cost attached to. To, to maintaining that, so so that's why we charge that raising fee up front, you know, to 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 partly cover that upfront cost that we incur, so that we can give you a lower interest rate over the period of the time uh, of the loan, you know. So so, so always look at, at the two in conjunction, you know. I, I've seen many uh, people wanting lower lower fees up front. Uh, uh, but if you go and do the math uh, and, and see what interest disc, uh, discount you get because you pay that uh, fee up front, it's it's really a no uh, a, a no brainer. You sort of recover that that fee in in reduced interest rates in in in, in the first couple of years or so. Um, and and then as you mentioned, Paul, it can all be capitalized. You know, so in other words, it can all be included into the loan. Um, uh, it's your choice. You don't need to do it, but we can do it for you. And I guess then that amortizes it over the period of the loan, which is not, um, which is not. And I get as as we've all said, it's it's a long term investment, so getting in, you can amortize those those costs over the duration of the yep. loan. Um, except to Petrovic's point earlier, obviously that increases your interest cost, um, which um, is again a, a decision you need to make. We have a um, a question here that's come through is. Um, just a final question um, before we end off is, does solar off on the grid increase the value of a property? Um, and I'm guessing this would go uh, to somebody taking the electricity bill down. Would we would we take that into consideration in reducing the expenses and therefore um, it's a you've got to obviously outlay the capital, but you have a saving on the on the monthly expenses. Would that be taken into account in a value of a property? Anybody? I'll go. Um, yes, it does, but not in in how the question was um, arranged. Um, it's electricity is an in and out for us, um, and so solar um, solar energy would be a, a it's its own separate line item in terms of how um, the how the um, sorry how the specific client um, deals with um, generating income and then um, sorry apologies. <laughs> So um, it would be, uh, yeah, so you'd have the cost anyway of the solar, you know, which, which would well, be an additional ready, and then because you'd have you'd have to pay for the solar over a period of time, the actual implementation. Yeah. Correct. Um, yeah, so but absolutely, I mean, we would we we would absolutely finance, um, if somebody is considering, maybe that's uh, what the question is around, um, is, is considering financing um, uh, solar, absolutely. You know, uh, uh, I think most banks do, but we we, we definitely do. Um, and 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 where where solar does uh, play a nice uh, role, sort of in 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 a property, is in your cash flows. Because remember, you can you can only sell electricity sell electricity to your uh, tenants at the same rate that that ESCOM would have charged. You know, so you can't take a profit on it. But you can step in and 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 earn that income for yourself. So 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 so, so whilst uh, we, from a pure valuation point of view, it may not push up the the value that much. It yes. improves your it improves your cash flow on a on a monthly basis. You know, and if you've got an improved cash flow, you can borrow more if that's what you're after. 
or you can charge your, your tenant less um, in, in terms of rates and be more competitive, uh, you know, than the building next door next who's, uh, yes. who's charging uh, ESKIM rates. Um, you can't charge more than ESKIM, but you can certainly charge less than ESKIM. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've come to the end of our time, and um, I was going to ask everyone to do a, a summary, but it looks like with the questions that have been asked, we've pushed ourselves to the to the limit. Um, we just want to, um, just in, in closing, I would really like to thank you guys. Um, we would like to just show a quick Connected Wealth um, video. It's an advert, um, and we we really like the concept of, of Connected Wealth. Um, if you look across our Ned, the Greater Nedbank Group, we have um, some amazing offerings that we can connect you to as our clients. And that goes back to all our conversations around getting to know you, establishing a relationship, and then connecting you to more. Um, and I would just like to, um, if you guys could, before we, and then I'll come back and we can finish off, uh, just to have a look at this, at this video, please. <laughs> There are many different sides to you. Is your bank serious about connecting your wealth to all of them? Our wealth advisors connect your money decisions to every facet of your life. We call it Connected Wealth. Hi, okay, and just in, in, in conclusion, I would really like to thank you, our, our clients, um, for taking time. I know time is an incredibly precious commodity. And again, to, to Emma, Petruiz, Kobesh, and Theo for giving us such great insights. Uh, remember that if we didn't get to your question, we try to get through, I think we got through 10 or 11 questions in the time. If we didn't get to your questions, you can uh, please, please, please contact us. The um, email address is uh, contact at nedbankprivatewealth. .co.za, and we will definitely get back to you. Um, I'll repeat that again. It's contact at nedbankprivatewealth.co.za. There is also a QR code which will appear on your screens now. We just we work really hard to um, improve our, our webinars and to, to garner information from you, and we'd really appreciate it if you would um, go in and, and do that, that, that short survey. The other, the final matter, there was a question in the in the, in the chat box around um, this presentation. You will receive an email in the next few days with the link to the recording of the conversation starter, and then that you can actually share if you think somebody else would get a, a benefit from watching it. Um, you you can certainly um, send it on to them or otherwise uh, watch it again, um, and. The other thing, obviously, is if, if you contact us, we can then um, send you to our, our web page where we have all the previous uh, webinars and uh, you can then watch those uh, in, at your leisure. Um, a final thank you to everybody, um, the guys who put this together, our panelists and you, our clients. Go well and stay safe. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>